afternoon, everyone. So I'm Anna Gross. I'm a science and environment reporter at the Financial Times. I'm very pleased to be here with all of you and to be taking part in the Trace Yearbook webinar launch. <clears throat> As many of you may know, the yearbook is Trace's flagship assessment of the state of forest risk commodities supply chains. Uh, the assessment uses Trace's unique supply chain data to reveal the commodities, regions and supply chains with the largest impacts on tropical forests, showing where efforts should be targeted to tackle deforestation. So this is going to be a one hour webinar. Uh, we're going to start with a 15 to 20 minute presentation on the key findings of the yearbook by Toby Gardner, who's Trace's director, and Helen Belfield, who's Global Canopy Policy Director. After their presentation, I'll invite some of Trace's amazing guest speakers to share different perspectives on the yearbook findings. So our guest speakers, all women, are Frances Seymour, Senior Fellow at the World Resources Institute, Nicole Polsterer, Sustainable Consumption and Production Campaigner at Fern, Deborah Diaz, Sustainability Manager at the Consumer Goods Forum. She, her camera isn't working, but you'll be able to hear her voice just fine. And Alice Thule, who's Deputy Director of Instituto Centro Givida. Um, after their comments, we're gonna have a short Q&A session. So I'll be asking some questions, but I'd also like to invite any of you guys to send in your own questions. You can just type them into the Q&A box and I'll be able to read them at the end and I'll try to cover as many of them as possible. Uh, so we have loads to cover and I don't, we don't have a huge amount of time. Um, I'd like to invite Toby Gardner to start with his presentation on the yearbook findings. Toby, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Can you just tell me if you can see my screen? Yeah, I can see it. Great, thanks very much everybody and, and welcome and thanks so much for joining us. Um, for those that are not familiar with Trace, I'd like to just start off by uh, mentioning what we're doing. Trace is a science-based supply chain transparency initiative um, that is focused on trying to empower uh, markets, governments, and civil society in a transition towards more sustainable commodity production and consumption. Um, and our mission in contributing towards this is to help revolutionize the transparency of global trade. Uh, and the way in which we've been pioneering this is to develop a new approach that allows the mapping of supply chains from regions where commodities are produced to countries where they're imported via the companies involved. And we're starting new work to look at patterns of ownership and financing of this trade as well. Uh, and this unique approach allows us to connect markets to production regions and therefore also uh, to impacts, to deforestation, uh, but also to sustainability conditions and investments on the ground. The Trace Yearbook is uh, is, as Anna said, um, our main uh, product that it tries to help deliver on two of the core uh, agendas that Trace is trying to support. Uh, on the one hand, to help empower and enable actors in markets, in government, in civil society, uh, to make more effective decisions around managing risk and around targeting investments for more sustainable supply chains. And the other is on strengthening the accountability around supply chains to help deliver on sustainability goals and reduce deforestation and associated emissions across the tropics. And the yearbook uh, helps achieve this uh, in a number of ways. Uh, and you just get a flavor here uh, of the content that is now live that you can look on in more depth, where we have summaries uh, and key statistics and indicators on the seven commodities that we're looking at, which is Brazilian soy and beef, Paraguayan soy and beef exports, Argentinian soy, and also exports of palm oil from Indonesia, and chicken from Brazil with the embedded soy and beef, uh, soy and, and corn uh, in chicken exports. And you also have summaries across the four main themes uh, of expansion, deforestation, the main traders and markets, hotspots of risk exposure, and deforestation commitments. So without further ado, the focus of our presentation now is on the four main questions that the yearbook as a whole, and indeed uh, Trace as a whole, is trying to answer. First, what is the problem that we're trying to address? How much agricultural expansion uh, is linked to deforestation, where we're really drawing uh, on work by many others, 
Um, and then secondly, who is buying the forest risk commodities and from where, which markets are dominating, which players are dominating? What are the patterns of dominance that we can see? Third, what are the greatest sources of deforestation risk in the supply chains of major buyers? To what extent can we see where patterns of risk exposure and deforestation are concentrated? And fourth and finally, what is the coverage of zero deforestation commitments that are being made not only by companies, but also by governments? And what impacts are we starting to see that they're having uh, that Trace can help tell us? So first, uh, in agricultural expansion uh, and conversion, we saw recently uh, the data that was launched by WRI through GFW, um, telling us that the, the rate of increase uh, in the last year of 2.8% was the third largest uh, in their time series since 2000, um, identifying and underscoring the fact that deforestation remains high and increasing across many parts of the tropics. There are some good news stories with deforestation de decreasing year on year for the last three years in some parts of Indonesia and elsewhere, but there are many other areas where deforestation is on the rise and new frontiers are emerging. And of course, we're mostly familiar with the news of the resurgence of deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon in the last few years, but also in many of the neighboring countries of Brazil. And the focus of our work in the yearbook is on the three biomes in Latin America, particularly in Brazil, of the Amazon and the Cerrado, but also the Chaco uh, and the Atlantic forest as well, um, in Paraguay and in Argentina. Where if we look across the board of all three of these biomes, annual deforestation rates have dropped if we compare uh, to a decade ago. So there is cause for celebration in some places, but it's worth bearing in mind that whilst these rates have dropped, that has been from, in, in some cases, such as in the Atlantic forest of Paraguay, because the forest has been mostly gone. And there's also been this recent resurge in deforestation, not only in Brazil, but in neighboring countries. And what is also critically important is when we look at biomes that have diminished in size, as continued clearance, uh, uh, con co clearances continue, the relative impact of that clearance uh, is greater for the biomes that have had, uh, suffered more historical loss. So in comparing across the biomes and the analyses that we've done, suggests if you look at the impact of a hectare of deforestation per hectare of forest remaining or per hectare of native vegetation remaining, which is an interesting perspective, then one hectare of loss in the Gran Chaco is equivalent in those terms to six and a half hectares of loss in the Amazon, bringing into focus just how much has already been lost uh, in the Chaco, but also in the Sahada. Now we know that cattle pasture is the dominant direct driver of deforestation across much of the tropics. And the analyses that we've done to cross detailed uh, land use change maps, uh, land cover maps with deforestation at the pixel level, uh, really underscore this. With the, with the, with the, the expansion of pastures for, for, for cattle, uh, cattle grazing um, uh, in 2018, uh, being attributed to, uh, to, to deforestation due to that expansion, uh, for some, somewhere near 95% uh, in the Paraguayan Chaco, over 80% in the Amazon, and over half uh, of the deforestation in the Cerrado. Direct deforestation for soy um, is concentrated, as we know, in the Cerrado. Uh, historically, there has been large expansion uh, of agriculture, particularly for soy, in Argentina, in the Chaco, and also in the Atlantic forests of Paraguay. Um, but at the moment, the main areas of expansion are in the Sahara, and particularly the Matapiba region uh, that we're familiar with. And we know that if we look over time, this is just a transition of, of increased uh, cumulative deforestation along the bottom there with production of soy in the Sahara, and we can see that large expanses of deforestation for relatively little increases in production uh, some years ago have been changed uh, for uh, a, a, an uptick uh, in production with relatively less deforestation in recent years as that curve becomes steeper. But in 2018, we still estimate that about 100,000 hectares of Sahara was cleared uh, with intent uh, to grow soy. If we look back at recent conversion um, of, of land that's been converted into soy uh, in recent years. But we also know that soy uh, can be an important indirect driver of deforestation, um, which is something that we've started to look at in our team. Uh, and prelimin preliminary work that we've done uh, indicates that for every hectare of 
pasture that is lost to agricultural expansion. And here we see a map of black areas, which are pastures that have been lost to agricultural expansion, mostly soy. For every hectare of pasture that is lost, at least one hectare of pasture expands onto, onto, onto forested land. So that transition uh, implies um, that there is a strong dynamic uh, of in indirect dynamic of land use change at play. So if we look at the expansion, the loss of pasture uh, due to agricultural expansion and compare that to the expansion of soy onto pasture here in blue, then you can see that the two coincide very neatly. And then we look at the expansion of pasture onto forest and we can see that it's being displaced into other regions, other regions of forest. Shifting now to look at which are some of the major markets and the, the major trends that we see in the data with regards to the destiny of these commodities uh, from these countries. But one clear pattern, of course, uh, is, is the fact that the trade in these commodities is concentrated uh, in the hands of relatively few companies. If we look just in the soy sector across Brazil, Argentina and Paraguay, then somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of that trade is in the hands of five companies. And if we look at the top five companies uh, here uh, across, across uh, those countries, um, the ABCD and COFCO, uh, then we can see that more than half uh, of the total exports are in the hands uh, of, those, of those companies. And typically what we find is that the market share uh, of trade uh, by companies is typically somewhat proportionate to their share uh, of the overall uh, deforestation risk. So this is um, a plot that, so, that shows you the amounts of volume uh, that then transitioned to the, uh, the overall deforestation risk that the major traders of Brazilian beef are associated with. And they're roughly the same, but some important companies start to come up uh, when you look from the perspective, not of volume, but of deforestation risk. Those that are sourcing from particularly high risk regions. And if we look at markets, what we can see in recent years has been a real surge in the dominance of China. Whereas 15 years ago, the European Union by far dominated uh, imports of Brazilian soy. This is looking at just the trajectory of, uh, of soy exports. We can see that in recent years, and the pattern is only continuing now in 2019 and 2020, uh, that China really pulled ahead, not just from the EU, but also from the domestic market uh, within Brazil. However, what our data also show and been able to discriminate the differences in sourcing patterns of major buyers, whether they be companies or countries, um, if we look in a, from the perspective of relative risk, hectares of deforestation per ton uh, of soy imports, then what we find that the imports into Europe uh, corresponded to, to a dub, doubling, to, to double uh, the relative deforestation risk of imports to China. And that same pattern over the last decade, and that pattern has only changed in 2018. And that pattern was also the same with imports of Argentinian soy, where Europe has been historically exposed to higher levels of relative risk. Although it's the inverse for beef, where much of the deforestation risk associated with Brazil's beef exports, the largest exporter of beef in the world, is destined for China. And with that, we'll turn now, I'll hand to my colleague, uh, Helen Belfield, uh, to take us through the next section of findings, starting with hotspots and risk uh, in commodity supply chains. Over to you, Helen. Thanks, Toby. So deforestation and emissions are linked to the production of commodities is concentrated in specific regions, and therefore sourcing patterns matter in terms of the risk exposure of commodity buyers. So this map here shows the greenhouse gas emissions from deforestation linked to beef exports from Brazil, and you can see that they're concentrated in the Amazon region and therefore buyers sourcing from such high risk areas have up to 10 times the emissions risk exposure than average. This pattern of risk concentration in a fraction of the supply chain is seen across all of the trade here but commodities. So more than 50% of the deforestation risk linked to commodity exports is from less than 5% of the producing regions. So this visual here shows a cattle deforestation risk linked to Brazilian beef exports for each of the cattle producing municipalities. So each circle is a, represents a municipality um, and the darker color red municipalities and the ones to the right hand side um, have high, the highest risk exposure. And this pattern of a handful of high risk regions is consistent 
for Indonesian palm oil exports shown here, as well as for Brazilian soy exports here and across the other commodities. So for these soy exports, uh, these high-risk municipalities are concentrated in the Matapiba region, which in 2018 accounted for 77% of China's imported deforestation risk, but only 9% of its supply from its Brazilian soy imports. So this pattern of risk concentration is also seen at the farm level. So a recent trade study shows that 80% of illegal deforestation on soy farms in Mato Grosso that took place in only 2% of the total farms. So shifting to commodities, we again see this pattern of risk concentration. So we've seen from Toby how cattle pasture expansion is the largest driver of deforestation in Latin America. So trace data shows that beef exports have high deforestation risk and that per ton of meat, Brazilian beef exports have a thousand times the deforestation risk of Brazilian chicken exports. But not all beef is the same. Risks are concentrated in products and in regions. Um, for example, live cattle exports from Brazil have five times the deforestation risk per ton than other products such as processed beef. Um, and this is due to the fact that they're mainly sourced from Pará State and the Amazon. Similarly, we can see that Paraguayan beef exports um, are associated with nine times the deforestation risk per ton than Brazilian beef exports. So in addressing these risks, many traders have made def zero deforestation commitments. And TRACE allows us to identify gaps in the coverage of these commitments across not only the, the companies, but also the production regions. So firstly, looking at production regions, we can see that Indonesian palm oil exports have the highest coverage of zero deforestation commitments of more than 80%, followed by soy exports from Latin America, with the coverage of beef exports lagging far behind. And strikingly, um, no exports of Paraguayan beef are covered by public zero deforestation commitment, despite their incredibly high risk. This data from Brazil, uh, for both beef and soy hides the discrepancy as well that the Amazon has a far higher coverage of its exports by ZDC commitments due to collective commitments such as the soy moratorium and the G4 cattle agreement um, than the Sahado. Although this gap is closing with new commitments by companies such as JBS and Glencore. So while many of the largest traders do have zero deforestation commitments, although they don't always extend across all biomes um, and geography and countries. Trace data also shows that there's a number of smaller companies um, with high deforestation risk per ton that don't have commitments. So this visual here, so each of the circles represents a company exporting, in this case, Brazilian beef. And the size of the circle indicates the deforestation risk per ton of that company's exports. The larger the circle, the larger the risk, the higher the risk per ton. And if the circles on the right hand side indicate the level of risk above the average, which you can see is the, the dotted line in the middle. So those companies in red, which indicates they don't have a commitment on the right hand side, have relatively high exposure per ton. And this pattern is consistent across soy exports from Brazil, as you can see here as well as soy exports from Argentina and also from Paraguay. So trace data, as well as looking at gaps in coverage, it enables us to assess the risk exposure of companies with commitments and those without. So here you can see the deforestation risk per thousand tonnes of committed companies, which are the green circles, and non-committed companies, which are the red circles, for each of the commodities that Trace covers. Um, and you can see the average risk of committed companies is a line in green, and the average risk of non-committed companies is a line in red. And while it's important to recognise that many of these commitments are recent, and that also some companies without public commitments may be taking action, currently, we're not able to see a clear difference in the risk exposure of committed and non-committed companies.
So going forward, we'd expect to see over time the risk of committed companies declining as they implement their commitments. So um, I hope we've given you a, a flavour of the key findings and the highlights from the yearbook. Um, there's a lot more content to explore um, at trace.earth. Um, but in summary, the, the main message really is that risks linked to commodity production and exports are highly concentrated, whether that's in production regions, traders, markets, or products. And this really provides a tangible entry point for targeted action to address these risks. So please do use the yearbook, uh, let us know how you're using it, um, and give us feedback for how we can improve it going forward. Uh, and many thanks, and I'll hand back over to, to Anna. Thanks, Toby, and, and thanks, Helen. That was really, really useful. Um, we have a, a few questions from, from uh, our viewers already. Just kind of, most of them are just kind of clarif clarifying points. So, so one of them is, does this data show the distinction between legal and illegal deforestation? Um, so I can help answer these ones quickly. Uh, not in all cases. Uh, we are looking at that in certain instances and we'd like to do it more. We have more detailed work on that in Brazil. Um, on how we compute, shall I just run quickly through the questions, Anna? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Go to ahead. not take too much time. I won't go into detail on the method. Uh, there is a detailed methods documentation on the website at trace.earth about methods. Please do ask us uh, for more detail. Um, and do I understand correctly that exports to the EU are more likely to be associated if present to China? Yes, during the last uh, decade, that pattern is changing for soy. It is not the case for beef. And the reason is because, on average, historically, Europe has sourced from high deforestation risk regions. Same question on illegality. And can you name the companies responsible for the biggest red bulls? All the data that you've seen. Uh, has um, the detail behind it within the yearbook. Um, so you can go in, you can look at the charts, those charts are interactive. You simply need to hover your mouse over them uh, to get the name of the company. And of course, the raw data can also be downloaded uh, from our site. With that, I'll pass back to you, Anna. Thank you for the questions. Um, so I just had a couple of questions as well. So one of them is related to, to what one of our viewers asked. So you say that the deforestation risk of soy from, from China is lower than that from the EU. And yeah, as you, as you outline, that's to do with where they source from. The EU sources tends to, to source from higher risk areas. But could, have you been able to identify whether that's to do with for example, a specific sustainability commitment that Chinese companies or the, the Chinese state has when it comes to soy, or, no, or if not to do with commitments, is there, is there anything at play apart from chance? Uh, so it's not, it's not chance. I mean, the critical qualifier here is that we're talking about relative risk exposure. So this is hectares of, 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 of deforestation per tonne of imports. China imports by far the most amount of soy and beef from Brazil. Uh, and in doing so, it's also associated with the, the, the largest uh, amounts of absolute deforestation risk exposure. But it's important in the same way that we look at per capita measures for carbon footprints, that we also look at the intensity of deforestation impacts associated with supply chains. And historically, because China, I mean, one of the key drivers is because Europe's proximity uh, to Northern Brazil uh, is, is a factor, but also historical relationships and contract agreements uh, and that is despite stronger sustainability commitments historically in Europe than in China. But that pattern is starting to change. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, and, and, and just one other thing I wanted to pick up on, Toby, from your presentation. You said that there'd been an increase in soy production without a correspondingly large increase in deforestation in the past few years. And I'm wondering if you have a kind of sense of why, what, what's made that possible? Is that, is that to do with co commitments that companies have made? So um, it depends on where we're looking. So deforestation for soy, directly for soy in the Amazon, um, has gone down to extremely low levels, uh, thanks to the success of the soy moratorium in the Brazilian Amazon. Um, deforestation uh, for soy in the Sahado uh, remains quite high. We're estimating about 100,000 hectares in 2018, but it's a lot lower than what it was 
uh, a decade ago. Uh, and the reasons for that uh, are, are, are many. Um, a lot of the accessible areas have been cleared, but also uh, concern and attention uh, towards this issue has gone up in recent years in the Sahado. Uh, so the, the attention not only of, 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 of markets and campaigners, but of companies themselves uh, has shifted more to this by um, which is critical because in relative terms, it's much more threatened uh, than the Amazon. Great. Okay. And, and I just want to remind uh, all of the attendees that, that later on there's going to be a Q&A session. So please send questions as we're going along and as we hear from the other panelists. And at the end, I'll try to ask as many of them as I can. There's a Q&A box, so you can just write in there. Um, so I'm now going to give the floor to, to Francis Seymour, who's Senior Fellow at the World Resources Institute. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, let me start by congratulating Toby and Helen for this amazing achievement. You guys just go from strength to strength. Um, I just want to make three uh, quick points um, based on this presentation and, and the yearbook. Um, the first is to express really deep appreciation for the actionable insights that are contained in this data and analysis. I think we all, you know, come into this with a sense of the broad outlines of the problem. You know, Brazil as the 800 pound gorilla is a producer country, beef as the big deforesting commodity, China as the rising importance of a market, you know, choke points of a, a few traders. But what this does is take it to a whole new level of granularity and combinations among those different um, factors that really provide no excuse for whether you're a company or a financier or a government or an advocate to really have a much better targeting um, towards where, as, as Helen put it, the risk is concentrated. So really just express appreciation for that. And in particular, um, I, I saw uh, in the executive summary of the report, this more focus on the carbon intensity of the um, commodities coming from different sourcing regions. And I think that's gonna be really important as companies increasingly include, include land sector emissions in their climate reporting and net zero commitments and all that. And so I, I really think that's a, it's really a, an important dimension that, that you guys are, are effectively bringing out. Um, the second point I want to make is to express a sense of disappointment. I think that everyone shares that we're not seeing more of a um, signal from the zero deforestation commitments in terms of reducing risk on the, the part of, of companies that have made those commitments. And I guess part of it is, you know, a need to tell myself be patient um, because it just takes time to, to put all this into place. And I commend to all of you a recent blog by Leo Fleck of the Moore Foundation um, that kind of details this architecture that's being put into place and sort of makes the argument that we're now poised to, to move to a whole new era of accountability. So hopefully we'll see that signal um, sooner rather than later. I'm particularly interested also and, and hope to see in, in future data um, some distinction between those jurisdictions where companies are proactively engaging to be part of the solution. And uh, again, need to be patient because a lot of these are really just now getting off the ground. But I, I take heart from what may be plausibly a preliminary signal from the GFW data from Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, um, suggesting you know, a, a significant drop in primary tree cover loss in 2019, which happens to coincide with when the Cocoa and Forest Initiative, both government and private sector actions really you know, started to get some traction. So, so maybe um, we can uh, find more inspiration for similar public-private collaborations at jurisdictional scale um, and informing initiatives like the VSA um, initiative that's trying to really you know, marshal committed buyers in, in particular places. Um, my last point is, sorry, I've got my uh, buzzer going off. Um, my last point is just to remind everyone that um, as valuable as this data is, all of it comes from an era before any of us had ever heard of COVID-19. And so it does not yet capture the direct and indirect impacts of the, the pandemic or the associated economic crisis or the responses to that crisis. And I think we can learn some lessons from the Asia financial crisis about you know, the boom in commodity uh, production that can often follow you know, a, 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 an economic crisis um, and some of the perhaps perverse policies that we've already seen some governments putting into place. So I just encourage everyone to think hard about what the likely implications of this uh, pandemic and, and economic response uh, are likely to be, to monitor for those impacts and do everything we can to influence the trajectory because the decisions that are made in the coming months are gonna influence the, what this data is gonna tell us next year and in years to come. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks a lot, Francis. That was really helpful. Um, so now we're going to be hearing, so I've got questions, but I'm going to leave my questions for the end. Um, we'll be hearing from Deborah Diaz, who's Sustainability Manager at the Consumer Goods Forum. Over Thanks, to you, Deborah. Thanks, Anna. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you fine. Great. Uh, first, I wanted to thank uh, the team uh, for inviting me to speak on this webinar. Um, like Francis, I, I commend all of the hard work that's gone into um, into the tool and uh, the additions to the tool, which I feel are uh, quite significant. Um, and as uh, again, as Francis said, provide um, actionable items and uh, look forward to learning more um, as things go live. Uh, so a bit of context of, about the CGF, uh, since uh, um, many from this group might not be familiar with us, uh, we're a membership organization of consumer goods companies. We're CEO-led um, and we bring together uh, about 250 to 300 retailers and manufacturers of the consumer goods industry, uh, among other, um, other actors. Uh, many of you might be familiar with a resolution we published in 2010 on helping to achieve zero net deforestation by 2020. Uh, well, we are at 2020 and uh, it became clear to us over time that we wouldn't be where we wanted to be in 2020 and we really needed to, to step up action. Um, and the way that we're doing this is building coalitions of action of willing companies, leading companies, who want to take this work forward and really accelerate action um, to address a number of issues. So we now have a forest positive coalition of action that has uh, 17 member companies, a mix of retailers and manufacturers, and we're working on a strategy that falls under a theory of change we developed over 18 months, a couple of years ago with a number of experts, and in particular, two elements of that theory of change that we feel um, we as an industry and as a group of leading companies should really I, focus on. Deborah, we're, we're losing you a little bit. I don't know whether that's the uh, same for everyone, but uh, I wonder if you could speak up just a little bit because I can't hear you very well. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, that's a bit better. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure what point you lost me, uh, but I was bringing up the new theory of change and the two elements that uh, two, rather three elements that we really want to focus on to do better um, at addressing deforestation on a global scale. So this is split into two areas, supply chain management, moving from deforestation or conversion-free supply uh, by individual companies to deforestation or conversion-free businesses across our suppliers' businesses. And also the second element, the integrated land use approach, where we want to help move from siloed and uncoordinated initiatives to integrated multi-stakeholder uh, land use and bringing consumer goods companies closer to what's happening on the ground. We're still working on the same three commodities we worked on in the past, palm oil, soy, and paper pulp and packaging. And we have a steering committee and working groups for each of these commodities. Um, I wanted to give this context because the trace data um, is very relevant to the work that we're doing. Um, we actually have some history with trace. Uh, we had uh, built a coalition called the Soy Buyers Coalition, a project which looked to link the supply chains of a collective of CGF companies with trace data to understand where we should focus our efforts. So we had a partnership with trace and Proforest to work on this. Uh, the Soy Buyers Coalition no longer exists in its former uh, form. Uh, it's now been rolled into the work that we're doing and we're exploring how best to leverage what we've learned through that project. Um, I think some of the things that we learned then and seeing the data that, um, that's been sh shared today, uh, I think greater transparency around flows and environmental impact could help companies and collectives such as ours um, to identify the specific actors and regions that require attention. And this is relevant both from a supply chain management approach and integrated landscapes approach. Um, and it's also interesting to see the focus on other geographies. We tend to concentrate a lot of our work on specific companies like Indonesia and Brazil for obvious reasons. 
Um, but for commodities like soy, paper pulp and packaging and beef, uh, beef uh, impacts aren't only concentrated in any one country or region. And uh, I think this greater visibility helps us determine where we can focus our efforts. Um, linking data to the carbon footprint is also, I find, quite interesting. Um, I mentioned that there were two elements that we want to focus on in our work. I think a third element that doesn't really fall into the levers of change that we identified is the, this point around transparency and greater accountability. That's something that we need to do better um, through our work. And um, it's been a challenge over time to find meaningful data that can link our actions to change on the ground. Um, having carbon footprinting data um, is, uh, I mean, besides the obvious interest for companies looking to reduce their carbon footprint, it helps provide a more direct way to measure impact potentially. Um, I mean, we've seen improvements in relation to palm, for example, and paper pulp and packaging in relation to deforestation. Um, but it's difficult to tell if and where we were able to make impact. And that's not just um, because it makes for um, a good story um, to show that we are having impact, but it also helps us to understand what is or isn't working in the work that we do. And tools like Trace help us get closer to the point where we connect, connect our actions to change on the ground, especially when it comes to things like, things like supply chain approaches. There are a few limitations I do see. Um, for the individual companies, there isn't yet an out-of-the-box way to connect Trace data and link to their individual supply chains. I think Trace works best when the data can be used by collectives um, of companies or other actors. Um, but there are many companies out there that also want to understand their own supply chains and um, find the, the prospect of, of tracing commodities quite daunting. Uh, obviously, Trace isn't the only tool out there to do this, but it could uh, hold the potential for it. And I think one, one last point is um, there's a limitation around the age of data or the age of the data. Uh, the more recent data, the better, especially when it comes to anticipating risks. Uh, that's all for me. Thank Great. You. Thank you, Deborah. That was, that was really helpful. Um, we've now got Nicole Polsterer, who's Sustainable Consumption and Production Campaigner at FERN. Hello, is this working? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, first of all, I also wanted to congratulate uh, the whole team behind Trace to make uh, this type of information available uh, in its granularity and accessible to all so that um, civil society groups and policymakers can monitor for themselves uh, deforestation and uh, commodity flows. So, fantastic. My uh, following uh, remarks, uh, I would like to point out that we do them uh, through the prism of looking purely at EU policies. I personally work more on Latin America and soya and beef, so um, please see my remarks in, in this slide. So I think this um, yearbook comes out very timely in, with this level of detail for at least four reasons in the EU context. One is that the uh, European Commission is just kicking off its uh, stakeholder process in, this autumn on how to deal with uh, imported deforestation and how to protect forests worldwide. There are also other policies that uh, this yearbook is uh, relevant to, such as the EU Farm to Fork strategy, which has recently been released, and the ongoing reform of the common agricultural policy. And obviously, soy is uh, important to, to that one. Uh, Secondly, this is very important uh, to see that this uh, type of information is accessible and can be made available because the EU is thinking about creating an observatory. And I think it shows that an independent uh, science-based uh, observatory is actually already existent. So this should definitely be used. Um, I would also like to encourage maybe um, the people who attend to look at what's going on in France. And in, in France, a stakeholder group under the French national strategy has already used the trace data to come forward with a suggestion on how an alert mechanism and how an observatory for soya going to the EU could work. I'm happy to share um, the link to the relevant campaigner in France in, in the chat later on. Uh, 
I would also like to point out with relation to observatory um, that I would find an observatory on land tenure issues and indigenous people's rights as relevant as a deforestation uh, observatory such as TRACE. Uh, thirdly, it's very timely um, because Germany has just taken on the presidency, presidency yesterday. It presented its own strategy, but it's also very timely because Germany is uh, pushing very hard to ratify the uh, Mercosur trade agreement. So it's good to have uh, more data on soya and beef coming into the EU. And fourth, and my last point on why uh, trace is very important to come out now, is because especially um, this information is spreading about deforestation in Brazil as the tension rises and Mercosur could become a reality very soon. So for all those four reasons, uh, congrats that this level of information comes out now. So I'm looking at my watch if I still have a little bit of time. And if I do, I would like to uh, point to three figures in this report that I think are very important to know in the EU context that were uh, presented in the executive summary. So one is that the EU has this high in, uh, deforestation risk in its commodities relative to, to China, or at least has had it for the past decade, and we'll see how, how that changes or not. Secondly, that Spain among the EU countries is um, has the highest greenhouse gas footprint related to its soya. And uh, third, third, that most deforestation uh, linked to soya in Mato Grosso is actually illegal. So why are these th uh, three, three figures so uh, key? So one is um, because we are always often told or asked, so is the EU at all relevant uh, if we look at the uh, the levels of imports that go that China does and I would say yes with the high deforestation uh, risk uh, per uh, per commodity per, per hectare yes we see it clearly still has a role the EU to play. Secondly um, Spain with its high greenhouse gas footprint um, it's not a signatory to the Amsterdam declaration so that, that is really a pity and we hope that this will really uh, put pressure on Spain to be more engaged on the issue. And uh, thirdly, this is important as the European Commission has currently a process going on with assessing two types of regulation, one on uh, corporate uh, company behavior more generally and the second one assessing options on reducing the risk of imported deforestation. So. Congrats again on making this available, and I hope we'll see this uh, yearbook for many more commodities to come. Thanks a lot, Nicole. That was perfect timing. Um, so we have our fin final speaker, who is Alice Thule, uh, Deputy Director from Instituto Centro de Vida, ICV. So I will hand over to you, Alice. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. So, good morning, everyone. Here it's 10.30 in the morning. <laughs> so, uh, first, I, I, would, I would like to, be, to begin saying how happy I am to be part of this, uh, the launching of such interesting data. And to be partnering with such a good partner as, as Trace. Thanks for, for the opportunity. Uh, I think my since my role here is to represent a Brazilian uh, national organization, ICV, I guess the, the best way is to show, uh, to show you how initiatives such, such as trade are fundamental uh, in our mission to reduce deforestation and, and to establish a low carbon uh, development pathway. So uh, our context in, in Mato Grosso is quite a good example of what is happening at, uh, at Latin American scale. Uh, we have a, a fair concentration of, of challenges uh, that are, I think are well described uh, in, the, in the first part of the, the your book. We have, uh, despite the, the dropping of deforestation 10 years ago, we, have, we are still dealing with agriculture extension and uh, direct impact uh, of deforestation. Um, and at the same time, we do have government and private actors' commitments, their deforestation commitments. So 
soy moratorium and uh, the meat agreement from the, the federal prosecutors. We, uh, in, in Mato Grosso, there is the PCI strategy, which is a, a specific strategy to reduce deforestation and, and reduce the climate in, uh, change impact at state level. So we have those uh, commitments, but uh, as the, the um, as the, the yearbook stressed very well, there is no discernible impact on reduction of deforestation. Last year, we had the highest rate of deforestation since 2011. So, and, and since there was a question on that, I think it's, it's uh, interesting to know that it's 90% uh, illegal. So we, the, the question of legality and illegality in Brazil is rather not so important. Um, so those data clearly show that uh, commitments are not enough. I, uh, I, I would say that we need to be patient, but uh, if commitments are, are necessary, they are not enough today. So the question is, is uh, at some point, what do we do next? And um, at ICB, our answer has been to, to uh, try to make public and private decision makers accountable to their commitment. So that showing that uh, it's not okay to have uh, illegality in your supply chain, consumer will react. And we had uh, today a very clear reaction from a Norwegian company of, of uh, salmon uh, on, on reacting on soy. Um, it's not okay to say that uh, your sourcing of, of is deforestation free if you cannot prove it. Because uh, as we, as the, the data on Mato Grosso uh, illegality uh, of deforestation for soy, for the soy sector shows, deforestation still uh, is still illegal in, in, in the soy sector. And it's very uh, limited to some of the, the, uh, of the properties. So it's important that uh, traders and, and private actors have a specific uh, tool and, and specific way to, to show it. That this is kind of this is their, their responsibility. So there is a need, a global need to build this chain of reaction. Um, so that bank, funders, consumers can play a role in decision making. And, and that's why I think this type of data of data published by the, the trade seal book are so interesting and so important because it's it helps us to build the story to, to collectively increase the perception of risk of deforestation. Uh, it's not only a, a risk of, of reputation, but it needs to be a risk of market. So with transparency, with data analysis, with storytelling and visualization, it's, um, I think we, we do have key elements to show the state of responsibility and, and to, uh, to be able to perform, uh, to, to implement accountability on that. Thanks a lot, Alice. That was really, uh, really interesting points that you made. Um, I, I had uh, one question that I wanted to, so we're opening up the, the discussion now to, to questions both from myself, uh, if you guys, panelists, have questions for each other, um, and also for um, those who've been watching to, to ask their own questions. So we've got a few already, but if you have more questions that you'd like to ask, can, you can continue to write them in the Q&A box now. Um, so one question I, I wanted to ask is that a big focus of this year, your book seems to have been um, on really trying to target the specific areas and sectors which have the very high levels of deforestation risk. And I'm wondering for, from a journalist perspective, do you think we need to kind of consider applying less generalized language to deforestation? So kind of pivoting away from the, the fires in the Amazon, destruction of the Amazon by farmers to, to deforestation in certain areas of the Matupiba region, um, specifically for, you know, live cattle export, that, that kind of thing. Do you think that we have a, a bit of a responsibility to make the, the areas of focus clearer? Who are you asking, Anna? Um, maybe... Toby, I think probably I'd be asking you. Um, so it depends on the audience, I think, um, because for some, the issue in the most general terms is new. So there's always a space for that. Uh, but my gut reaction is yes. Um, I think in order for uh, 
um, reporting to be more tied to action and to guide where the action is needed, then we do need to be more specific. And a lot of the reporting last year around the Amazonian fires, it brought a lot of attention to, to the issue, but it was incredibly broad brush and incredibly blunt. Um, and it ended up tarring basically everyone who was somehow linked to Brazil as necessarily being linked to the Amazon and therefore necessarily being linked to fires. Um, and that doesn't get you very far. Um, so we do need to be more strategic because there are good actors out there and there is progress being made. And until such time as we can better discriminate where the problem is and where it isn't, uh, and who needs to do more and, who, and who's already showing progress, then we won't be able to understand when progress is really being achieved. Thank you. Thanks for that, Toby. Um, Francis, I, I wanted to ask you, so, so you mentioned that towards the end of your section that, that, that it's really important that we realise that data was compiled pre-COVID. Um, I'm wondering what, you, you, you outlined a couple of things, but I'm wondering what you think uh, some of the effects that of COVID are, we should look out for are. Um, yeah, that's my question. I guess the one I would highlight is that um, there will be momentum on the part of governments wanting to stimulate economic recovery and create jobs and all of that is, is understandable. And so our job is to elevate deforestation risk into those conversations, whether they're in the context of um, you know, national level discussions on recovery packages or lending from multilateral development banks to support them. Um, to make sure that we don't repeat mistakes of the past in terms of bailing out uh, companies that have unsustainable business models and highlighting the equity impacts of different ways of solving this problem in terms of investing in green jobs versus other alternatives or dealing with the um, household distress that may result from the economic crisis with conditional cash transfers rather than, you know, uh, supporting industries that, that drive deforestation. So, um, I, you know, I have, could have go through a list of 10 different things that we could be focusing on, but in general, job number one is to get forests into these discussions because right now they're still kind of in a footnote or in an afterthought or a sort of second or third order consideration that they need to be um, front and center of the discussions. Great. Thanks for that, Francis. So I've got a few questions here now from, from uh, attendees. Um, so one from uh, uh, someone called Jules. Um, although exports only represent about 20% of total production, are the 80% of beef produced and consumed in Brazil linked to similar or lower or higher levels of deforestation risk? I guess that would probably go to, to Toby. Uh, yep. Um, the first thing I would say, because this number is often bandied around and it diminishes the importance of the exports, Brazil is still the world's largest exporter of beef. Not many countries export a lot of beef because it's mostly consumed domestically. Um, the short answer to your question is the production of um, beef for the domestic market on average is associated, our data show, with higher levels of deforestation than exports. And that, quite interestingly, uh, is the same across biomes. Uh, and one of the consequences that that has, and there is, there is a short report on this inside the yearbook, um, that when demand for Brazilian beef exports goes up, as it does do uh, in response to a lifting uh, of a ban from the EU due to a state becoming uh, foot and mouth free, uh, or China uh, authorizing more slaughterhouses uh, to, to import from, or the US lifting a ban on fresh meat imports. Wherever that happens, we can expect an increase in deforestation linked to those increases in exports because they're needing to take the extra supply from the regions that were otherwise uh, supplying the domestic market, which on average are linked to more deforestation. And evidence for that uh, comes if we look historically when the, the fresh meat ban was lifted in the US in 2017 temporarily, then there was a marked uh, spike uh, in deforestation linked to beef imports uh, into the US from Brazil. Great, thanks Toby. Um, so we, we've had various questions um, on the, the uh, zero deforestation commitments, um, which as Francis said, uh, on the face of things might seem a little bit concerning. Um, 
So one, one person has asked, are you saying that it doesn't matter whether companies have a commitment or not in terms of their risk exposure or in terms of the actual deforestation in their supply chains? Prefer to Helen on that. So um, Trace measures the deforestation risk exposure of companies um, linked to the production regions that they source from. Um, we're not able to link deforestation impacts per se to company supply chains because we don't map down to the farm level. Um, so that's the first thing. In terms of the deforestation risk exposure of companies that have commitments or don't have commitments, at the moment there is no difference in their risk exposure. But many of these commitments are new, particularly outside of the Amazon biome. A lot of the commitments have been made in 2016, 2017, 2018, and there's more commitments being made um, this year as well. So we may not be expect to see a difference yet. Uh, as Francis said, we'd expect we need to be patient and over time we'd expect to see a decline in the deforestation risk of companies with commitments as they're implementing those commitments. Great, thanks Helen. Um, someone has asked, did, did Frances Seymour refer to VSA as in verified sourcing areas and can she el elaborate on the use of jurisdictional landscape uh, approaches and where, when, how she considers these could be effective? Great question. Um, I can only answer briefly. Um, I am most familiar with the initiatives underway in Indonesia, um, many of which are at the district level, Kabupatens, where um, a number of, of district heads have committed to green development and are being supported by a, a round table that, that links them together. Um, and there are a number of such districts that have sort of either multi-stakeholder processes to bring companies, government, civil society together to try to shift land use trajectories. In some cases, the private sector has grouped together separately. So for example, in the district of SEAC, this is one that is showing some promise of, of actually having an action plan to, to move ahead. But I hasten to say that all these are very early days in that um, in many of the jurisdictions around the world where these groups are coming together, you know, it's like this, they're in the first year of implementing action plans. And so, again, that's why I was saying we sort of need to be patient and, and give them time to actually have an impact on the trajectory of forest loss. Um, but if we don't see it soon, we need to revisit. Um, but I, but I, I do see some, some promising experience, experiments going on around the world. Great, thank you. Um, that is all we have time for in terms of questions, but we, we have several more via email and also um, in this chat box. So we're going to endeavour to answer, or not me, but the Trace team are going to endeavour to answer all of those questions via email. Um, so you can expect those. So I just want to thank everyone who joined uh, on behalf of the Trace team. Um, the, the organisers are going to be distributing a recording of the webinar to all of the participants and invite you to explore some of the yearbook content on insights.trace.earth. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks to all the panellists. You're great. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much, thank, you. thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.